Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And I, I do hope that um, you go home and put on a good flea spray and tick remover, and you're out in the woods right now, so... Pray for VBS this week. Amen. Pray that it goes well, that we see souls saved, and that God works. Amen. I was working on this outline last night, and it turned to 17 pages. Now, obviously, I, I, I'm not going to preach 17 pages. No. So we're going to kind of... We're going to go through it, and I, I picked, it was kind of like, was it Star Wars? Was it Star Wars? He started with the end, yeah. and then later on when it got popular, he decided he could fund the beginning. Well, we're going to start at the end, and we'll finish with the end. So um, uh, it's funny how sometimes you'll just get rolling, you'll read the Bible, you'll read something, and you just God just starts speaking to you. So I'm just going to pretend like the first seven or eight pages of this outline were to me, not to you. And we're going to go through the end of it. But Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, the Bible says this. It says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. I didn't just mute myself, did I? Yeah. Okay. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. My message this, this morning still is entitled, A Masterpiece for God. A Masterpiece for God. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you. We praise you for your word. We thank you, God, for the truth of it. And Lord, we do pray for the activities this week. We pray, Father, that you would bring in some, some kids, Lord, that uh, we would see some souls saved. We pray, Father, if there be anybody here today that has never accepted you as their Lord and Savior, God, we ask that today would be their day of salvation. Father, for the Christian that maybe is, uh, Lord, just doing their best, trying to make it through this life, and uh, Lord, live for you, I pray, Father, that you would help us to maybe see from a different perspective today of, of what you've made us to be, what we ought to be for you. We give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for all these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. A masterpiece for God. There are countless traits that are found in each brushstroke of every different artist. Some do better abstract work, say like a two-year-old. Some artists excel at natural settings or people or others prefer old Americana, maybe even like a Norman Rockwell or something like that. You can look at that picture in my dad's office. My, my grandma gave him this, um, this picture years ago and it's this, this old farm setting and, and it's, it's, I think it's a Norman Rockwell, but it's an old farm setting and it's, it's got that yellow ribbon on the mailbox kind of like maybe a World War II or World War I type of a setting. And, and you can just get lost in some of those photos. You, you just can stare at them. Like the masterpiece, though, showing off the different sides of the one that created them, you and I are, too, supposed to be the same way. Years ago, we went on a double date with Tim and Veda Stewart, and uh, we went down to Portland, and we were, we were killing some time, and... We went into one of those stores where you ever see that artwork that you look at on a wall and if you stare out long enough, it becomes like this 3D thing. Well, we were, we were killing some time and I don't remember what even got us in that store, but we started looking at, we started looking at those and, and I, I really got enthralled by them. They were kind of a new thing and I was just like looking and, and, and everybody's like, do you see it yet? Do you see it yet? And, and everyone's like, oh, I see it, I see it. And it's like, I don't see it. And you get frustrated, you know, and, and, and they're like, you know, look at it. Look at it cross-eyed. And you, you see all these people that are looking at it, and three or four of them see it, and the other one is sitting there all frustrated. And you see him, and he's looking at it, and he's doing like this, and, and kind of doing this, and, you know, and they're all just staring at this thing. That's what God created you and I to be. He created us to be that masterpiece. 
When you and I accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, the Bible says, old things pass away, behold, all things become new. Total separate thought this morning I was reading in Proverbs, the Proverbs of the day, and I, I can't even remember, I couldn't even quote you the verse, but it talked about the person that fears God and, and the benefits that, that they have and the one that doesn't fear. And I was just thinking about it today. Uh, uh, we live in a society, I remember when I was growing up in high school back in the, in the 80s, late 80s and, and early 90s, they, were, they had these shirts that became really popular. And I don't know if it was a name brand, but it said, no fear. Does anybody remember those? Yeah, yeah I had these shirts, and they, they said, no fear. And, and everyone, everyone uh, uh, wore those things. High school guys always wore them. I had a couple T-shirts that said, no fear on the, on the top. And I was really cool because my shirt said, no fear. But the problem is, is that the more that people don't fear God, have you ever noticed the more they fear everything else? Have you looked at our society today? Everybody's afraid of everything. Uh, we, we, we've, we've essentially shut down our entire economy for nearly two years because we're afraid. We're so afraid of dying that we wouldn't live. And you know, when people fear God... Everything changes in your life. You know, when you accept Christ, when you finally don't care what the person at work says, when you get to the point where, for some people, it's they got to get to the point where they don't, they don't care what their family thinks anymore. They get to the point where, you know what? What their opinion is not me, worth me dying and going to an eternal hell. And so finally someone says, I fear God. I'm done fearing all of this that masterpiece starts to get created. If you're here and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've never taken that first step, that first personal walk, do you understand today that you're a marred canvas that the master is waiting to put on his easel so he can make a masterpiece of you? That, that painting starts... At the foot of Calvary's cross, if you're here and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, old things, old things can't pass away and, and new things become new. You can't become that new crea cre creature, that new creation until you've surrendered to Christ. The Bible tells us in John chapter 3, verse 3, a, a religious man, there's a lot of religious people that are going to die and go to hell. Because they've never put their faith and trust in Christ. They're trusting today in being a good person. Well, I'm a good person. Surely I won't go to hell. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible tells us there's none righteous. No, not one. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Being a good person has never taken anyone to heaven. The rich man came to Christ and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus had to point to him when he said, well, I've followed the law. Jesus had to point to him, no, you haven't. You're deficient. And you know, every one of us in this room is a masterpiece of some kind that God is waiting to paint. Every person. Yeah, well, I, I certainly couldn't be what, what brother or sister so-and-so is. I, I certainly could never measure up to, to this person or, or to that family or to... No, 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 everyone's a masterpiece. God's waiting to paint. You're a masterpiece that God is waiting to paint. And it's all in the detail. Every brush stroke is, is something that's unique to you, that's unique to the God that served you, but something has to happen in your life first. A religious man came to Jesus Christ by night by the name of Nicodemus, and he says, Master, he says, Rabbi, we know that you're sent from God. You're a great teacher, prophet, everything but the Messiah is what he called him. And Jesus looked at him that day and said, 
In John chapter 3, verse 3, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Listen, this morning, if you're here, God wants to make you a masterpiece. But it starts somewhere. And for the child of God, they all had the exact same start. Oh, masterpieces are different. Yeah, you take somebody like a, a Pastor Stewart and, and, and his energy and his excitement, and, and he's got his uniqueness about him and what God does has done with him and, and used him for. And, and, and then you take somebody like a, 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 like a John Derrick or, or, or even a Rob Harding or somebody like that that maybe isn't, isn't quite as out there, although Rob can be at times. <laughs> But, but you say, oh, they're, they're so different, they're so unique, they, they, they both, both will get up and they'll preach, and, and God uses them in different ways, and it's just amazing the uniqueness of God, but it all started at the same place for every one of us. Amen. At the cross of Jesus Christ, if you're here and you've not put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, or you're trusting in being a good person... There is only one way to heaven. The Bible says there's only one name under heaven whereby we must be saved, and that's Jesus Christ and Him alone. If you're here and you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, we'd encourage you today to make sure that you've had that start. You've had that start. The Master pours His work into the detail. And God does that. Every detail, everything about your life. You know, Sometimes people believe that there's there's a, a, like a, a theistic evolution type of a person just believes that God created the spark of life or God put the elements in place and then they, he just kind of left them. And you know, nothing could be further from the truth. The Bible tells us in the Old Testament that he's a God that's near, not far. He's interested in everything about you. In the New Testament, the Gospels, he, the Bible is clear that he's got every hair of your head numbered. He, he knows everything about you. Uh, he, he told one of, the, one of the major prophets that he knew them from their mother's womb. And, and that's true for every one of us. God knows everything about you, every detail, every specificity of, of your being. God knows. He knows. He's interested in you today. You were just di discouraged last week. God knows. You were depressed. You lost a loved one. You, you, you found out that you're sick. You found out about this or that or whatever it might be. Maybe it's just insecurity. God knows. You're, you're, you're stressing out about your checking account. Inflation, gas prices. God knows all of those things about you. You look at people that have a mom and a dad and you never had that. And there's this insecurity as a dad, am I going to fail? I didn't have those things. I never had a dad in my life. As a mom, I never had a mom in my life. Or my family's fragmented. And man, I got all these insecurities. I got all these worries. I got all these concerns. God is there. He knows. He knows every part about it. Every part of the masterpiece of what you are, of what God's created, He knows all of that. It's in the detail. He pours His emotion into the work. You and I should do the same thing, Christian. We should pour our emotion. That's page one. We should pour our emotion into the work. I just don't have any room up here. I'm sorry. We should pour our emotion into the work. Listen, as a Christian, as a child of God, you and I should be the same way with others. We should love one, one another. We should have that, that same desire. If you've accepted Christ as your Savior, don't just take this incredible gift that God's given you. Do you understand that part of the artwork of what you are is what you impart on others? You know, a lot of people will take an expensive piece of art and they will put it in the basement somewhere. Because, you know, after a while, light can fade artwork and, and it can, it can, if it's in the wrong environment, it can ruin it and all these different things. And so what a lot of people will do is they'll store this expensive printing away and no one ever gets to see it. No one ever gets to enjoy it. 
Do you know the whole idea of artwork, the whole idea of the masterpiece is that people can look at it, that people can, people can see the, 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 the master's work. One of my favorite, I guess it's a poem, I've heard it turned into a song, but you ever hear that, the story about the old violin? And the auctioneer stands up and tries to auction off this old violin for a dollar or whatever. And, and nobody wants it. But then the master comes up and he plays the violin beautifully. And pretty soon everybody's interested in the violin. And you know, that's what you and I are in the hands of the master. Amen. You may be here today and say, well, there's not much God has to work with. We're all sinners. There's not much to work with. But this is the great thing. It's not about the piece of art. It's about the artist. Amen. You and I should be a light for others to see. And do you understand as the artist has put his time in us, we also should put time in others as well. Charles Spurgeon once said this. He said, carve your name in hearts, not on marble. And you and I should do that. We should be that. We should be what God has called us to be. Paul's heart for others had an effect on the people he influenced. And it's true today. It's very hard to be flippant about some, something that, or someone that has great affection for you. But the master creates heart in his masterpiece. There's a, a, an old quote I love. It, it goes like this. It goes, you'll never win your neighbor's heart with anything less than your own. The Apostle Paul said this in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. He said, I thank God whom I, whom I serve for my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. He said this about a preacher boy that he had trained. A young man that looked at the masterpiece of God in the Apostle Paul and became a masterpiece of his own. But we see this, this affection that Paul had, much of the affection that God had for you. He says, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded in thee also. Listen, do you, do you have affection for others? The, the artist commits to the work. The Bible says this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. It says, if there be any consolation in Christ, any, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord. What a picture of Christ that we see in us. The picture that he has is, he is put in us, the, 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 the love that he has, we always look at this as being an application for you and I that we have the same mind that Christ has. But just let us just for a moment look at this portion of Scripture as what it says about the love and the mind Christ has for you, for me. If there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy fulfill ye my joy, that ye but be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And listen to this, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He became a servant, though. It continues on showing us the servant that Jesus Christ was for us. Think about the time and the commitment the master put in for you to be a masterpiece for him. This portion of scripture shows us so well how our heart should tie in with our mind when it comes to our service and how it should tie in with the mind of God, a heart for one another. Have you ever walked in someone's den or in their office and they have a picture that's half done on a stand? Maybe even compliment the picture. Then you find out they started it years ago and they just haven't finished. 
They got distracted with other things. Maybe the, the, the fellow in, the, in his dream project car in the garage, it's, it's still on stands and you see, the, you see the potential of this, but it's not been fulfilled. You may even see that car and it's a good illustration, the, the potential that it has. You may even see the beauty, but he's never driven it. The engine's not in the thing. Many Christians today stay in this state. They, they stay on the easel of God constantly. People will go and, wow, the, you're talented. They're gifted. Or they'll go and, wow, what a spirit. What, what, what a blessing that they are. But, but, but they're on an easel, half finished, never seen. Or in the garage and, and behind a, a garage door and the paint job's done, but the engine's not quite in the car. And, and you'd say, well, in this case, it's certainly the artist's fault. He's been distracted. But, you know, this is where the difference comes between you and I and God. The car that sits in the garage is, is, is the mechanic or the builder's fault. He's been distracted, but do you know when you and I, when you and I are the artwork that sits on the easel, unfinished, it's not because the master's unwilling to finish it. It's because the artwork has decreed not to be done. You and I are a masterpiece for God. He commits to his work. Let me ask you this, this morning, have you committed to it? Have you committed to it? I was talking to a father a few weeks back, and we were talking about his, his kids. And he said, you know, he said, um, they're almost grown now, and I have spent no time with them. And he was talking about some of the attributes that he's seeing in them that he's not. And we, we were talking about one of, the, one of the conclusions that he came to is he said, I regret the amount of time I just didn't spend with them. And now they've got to the point where it's just, it's, it's too late. They're in their teen years. Habits have been established. I thank God it's never really too late, but it certainly makes it more difficult. Listen, Christian, time is going to go by and, and the artwork starts to fade. And it's not the master's fault. What is the art saying? Are you and I what we're supposed to be? He pours his effort into the work. But he also uses the right tools. It takes the right tools. It's in the detail, but it also takes the right tools. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, the Bible says, And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, they're writing to a church here, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest I'm rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint mine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Listen, today Jesus Christ has given you and I an open invitation. Oh, well, maybe today I'm talking to somebody who's, you're struggling. You know what's going on in your heart. You know what's going on in your mind. You know what's going on in your life. Maybe today you look in the mirror and you see so many things about you you don't like, inside and out, and God says, listen, let me create the masterpiece. Let me create the masterpiece. Let me do it. So many times we take our life in control, and, and we try and grab on to those things. Last week, Dave Alexander stood up here before he sang a special, and 
He talked about how us men, sometimes we like to control and manipulate things until finally we can't control it anymore. And then finally, we have nowhere else to turn but God. Listen, why don't you just give control to the master now? Let him take it now. Are we what we're supposed to be for him? Are we doing what we're supposed to be doing? Or are we walking around going, no, I'm good? Remember a preacher at camp years ago said, you know, he said, have you ever talked to somebody and, and we've just learned to say that? How you doing? I'm good. How you doing? I, I'm good. I'm good. Everybody's good, but the world's falling apart. Yeah. Everybody's good, but their life's falling apart. Everybody's good, but their heart, their marriage, their emotions, they're on and on and on. It could go falling apart. You're not good. Do you know the Bible has an answer for that? Yes, sir. There's none good. That's what he told the rich man. There's none good but one. Right. No, we're not good. It's not good. And, and listen, I'm not, I'm not advocating that the next time someone says, how you doing? You go, I messed up. <laughs> you ever been around the people? You don't want to ask how they're doing. You just say hi because you know they'll tell you. No, but the truth is, so many times we, we, we're messed up, we're backslidden, we're not serving. Uh, we, we've got all of this anxiety of life, we're overwhelmed, we're, we're afraid, we're discouraged, we're depressed. You know, those are some of the weights that Pastor uh, Stewart was talking about when I think about weights. Maybe even, I wasn't here for Brother Harding's message this morning, I was in the youth, but maybe those are some of the weights that we're dealing with. Just the weights. And Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, the Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Do you understand that the masterpiece isn't just supposed to sit on an easel, half done? Oh, I understand the Christian is always a work in progress, but there comes a point in time where the master should get to drive the car he's created. There comes a point in time where the musician should get to grab the instrument and play it. I was given a guitar. It, it's a Gibson. I played it for my special here a few weeks back. And I have a guitar at home that I think it's like, Four or five hundred dollar guitar, and I have a Gibson that, as far as I know, it's a few thousand dollars that was given to me. This is guitar, beautiful guitar. Now I don't have the appreciation for it, the eye for the detail. I, I've just started playing the guitar. I'm not particularly great at it. I can't do all of the cool stuff. But I brought it to church a few weeks ago, and I told I was talking to Brother McNeil, and Brother McNeil says. Uh, I said, you know, I really can't tell much of a difference between my $500 guitar and this guitar. He goes, brother, that's a, that's a Gibson. There's a big difference. He said, when's the last time you changed the strings on it? I'm like, I think the strings that are on it, the one that came with it. He's like, how old is it? I said, it was made in 1995. He said, well, you bring it. I'll put new strings on it. So I bring the guitar, and he grabs the thing, and before he even changed the strings, he's like, are you okay with I, if I play it? I'm like, well, yeah, play it. He starts doing this stuff on it. I'm like, oh, I hear a difference between that guitar and my $500 guitar. There's a difference between a good musician and an amateur. And I could hear it. I could tell. And it was funny, too, because like I went home after he changed the strings, and the strings made a big difference too, but I went home, and it was like I was doing some of my other stuff, and my wife was like even going, yeah, I hear a little bit of a difference. I right, no, watch this. And I grabbed a pick, and I did a couple things that I can't do in a song, or I can't do just a couple things, and I did. She's like, oh, yeah, that does sound different. I'm like, yeah, see, I can only do one or two of those things, but somebody who knows how to play can do a lot of them. And they can actually sing a song doing some of these things. And it makes a difference. And you know, some of us, we, we're just sitting in a guitar case. We're not, we're totally unfinished for God. And many of us, we've been, we've been Christians for years. 
We've been sitting on an easel in God's den. And the, the crazy thing about it is the artist is going, let me paint you. Let me work on you. Let me do the masterpiece. Let me do it. The funny thing was is that when Brother McNeil offered to change out my crystal, oh, no, 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 brother, don't worry about it. No. He's like, no, let me do it. I'm like, you know, can I pay you? To? He's like, Pastor, there's seven bucks to do the strings. He had, he had them done in like 15 minutes. Do you know, we so often do that to God. Yeah, no, no, no. And we get these... Pastor Yant kind of referred to it with the teens, but so oftentimes we, we look at God as being unfun. We look at God as being this chore. We look at, we look at God as being cumbersome in life. Oh, you know, I, gotta, I should have biblical standards. I should live like a Christian. Well, that's no fun. And so we, we, we paint this picture but then when my strings got changed and my guitar was done, it was like, man, this thing is nice. And you know, I have counseled with people for over two decades now. And you know, I have never had the person come in and tell me, man, I regret giving my life to God. I sure wish I would have stayed on the bar scene. That was so much more fulfilling. I wish I would have stayed on the drugs. I wish I would have just lived my life for me. Or the person that comes in and says, you know, I just, I'm forgetting about God. It's, it's so much better for my family to, for me just to live for me. No, it's, it's always the opposite. I've been at the bedside now of dozens of people before they've passed away, before they've died. And I have never once had a person going off into eternity going, man, I sure wish I hadn't lived for God. My last one, it was funny because Pastor Stewart literally had come in, right, it was either right before or right after, I think it was right before uh, uh, or right after Carrie and I had, we'd gone in and it was Rosella, Rosella Roulette. We walked into her room we went in there. I prayed with her. She, she was what I thought was incoherent. And we, I, we prayed with her and my wife held her hand and I opened some scripture and I read the Bible and gave her some verses. And as we walked out, the nurse called her family. Pastor Stewart, I think, was walking in. She had just passed off into eternity. But the nurse said, you know, when you guys were in there and you were reading those verses, it was like... It was like just that last thing, that last thing that she needed. Her daughter said the same thing. I, I don't know. I wasn't there before. I, didn't, I wasn't there to see, but she was responding to us, squeezing our hands, and, 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 and you could tell she, she breathed differently, and it was like she just was able to let go. Louise Moore, same thing years ago. We, my wife and I walked in just before she was getting taken off, and, and they just now just put the ventilator on. She was still conscious. She would die later that day. And I remember my wife and I looked at her, and, and we, we grabbed her hand. We said, Louise, we're praying for you. And she looked at us and pointed straight up to heaven. God's people die well. But folks, too many of them don't live well. We live our life on the easel in God's den. And God is anxious to paint us. To make something. And too many of us are so caught up in the everyday affairs of this world. Listen, uh... If, if you're going to be a masterpiece, a masterpiece requires love. Truth requires love. In 1 Corinthians 13, 6, the Bible says about love, charity, in your King James Version Bible, uh, it, 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 calls it, it calls it charity. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 6 says that it rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. To prepare yourself for truth, you have to possess love. 
You got to possess it. And the artwork can't become a masterpiece if it's not willing to take the truth. People that struggle to have love are often the ones that will use truth to destroy others. If you want to get to a place that you can rejoice in truth when it's presented to you, you have to possess love. People that can't handle the truth lack love in their life. Love is not gossip. I, my wife and I were talking about this, and we have made so many mistakes in ministry, but one of the things, we were just talking about this the other day, one of the things that we have taken joy and some solace in is that of all the people over the years that have left our church that have gotten mad at me, oftentimes I have noticed their kids are mad at me too. And, and almost all the time, we had one situation where a family left, the daughter came back and kind of railed on Carrie and I a little bit and was just a little bit of a snippet. You could tell that mom and dad had been talking and spreading some seeds. And, and, and I actually sent a letter to their, do, to their other kids, a nice letter just saying, hey, you know, whatever happened between your parents and I, I understand this. It doesn't affect how we feel. We're still praying for you, and we still do. We still pray for them. But all their kids were mad at us, and they don't talk to us. And the funny thing is, is one of the first times that my kids saw them, they went and hugged on them. You know, love does not spread dissemination, hate, gossip, right. murmuring. One of, the, one of the things that killed the children of Israel, one of their offsetting sins is they'd go into their tents and murmur. When we do that, we are not ready to be a masterpiece for God. There has to be love. And, and without love, you can never, you can't rejoice in the truth. You can't accept the truth. Love, love is not aggressive. It will not use truth to belittle little someone either. Love has to love other people enough that truth makes the relationship better, not worse, regardless of the iniquity. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. So for me to be prepared to hear the truth, I have to love other people. This makes total sense with what Jesus Christ said and how it all comes together. What did, the, what did our Savior say? All the law and the prophets is built on this. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. What? The second is like unto it. Love thy neighbor as thyself. One of the problems that has plagued so many churches today, there's two. One is an absence of truth. They preach on love all the time. They never preach on truth. The other is the extreme. They're always preaching on truth, but they have no love. Both are wrong. Both are messed up. Both struggle to create masterpieces of their own in their church. Because love is part of the law. God says that He is love. The death on the cross is not to judge for judgment. The death on the cross is... So God can save an unsaved world. Amen. When his disciples came into a town, it was ironically the Samaritans. When they came into a town and wanted to call fire down from heaven, Christ said that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. He said, you know not what spirit ye are of. And it's interesting to me that several places in the Bible, specifically in the New Testament, the Bible says to try the spirits. And yet when we're shown the spirit, that's the thing we're seeing. The first fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. That's what the Spirit produces in the believer. And then when that happens, the believer can dispense the truth. Because people can handle it. They can take it. It becomes palatable. Have you ever heard someone say, well, this is their problem, but I think it would be better coming from you than me. Why would somebody say that? Because they've not set themselves up to be able to dispense the truth. They may dispense the truth, but they have no compassion. It's the exact opposite of the Spirit of God. 
And if it's not the Spirit of God, then you need to ask yourself this. What spirit is it? The masterpiece can't walk in a different spirit. You and I need to be a masterpiece for God. It requires truth. And truth requires love. It's not, it's not just a part of it. It requires it in the Word of God. It's the very essence of it. It's true that Jesus Christ speaks about the truth of hell more than he does heaven. But do you understand? His love for us is described far more than either one of those subjects throughout the Bible. It's our love for him that will determine what we listen to. Someone who claims to love Christ but rejects the word has no love for him at all. And that's certainly a big problem in our society today. We must love the truth itself. The masterpiece must love the truth. This is tough because truth can be hard. As a kid, I hated medicine. Medicine's actually pretty decent now, but back when I was a kid, it was horrible. But I learned to love the, the, the effects of it, the after effects after I took it. The truth of God is the same way. It, it, it was the truth of God's word that told David he had sinned against God. But instead of being destroyed by it, he embraced it and became better for it. We can see that he had, pre, he had a prepared heart. Not only did he love God, he loved the truth. And Psalms 119, oh how, how, oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. I hate vain thoughts, but thy law do I love. Therefore, I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. I hate and abhor lying, but thy law do I love. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Being completely honest, I can't say I love all the commandments of God. There are things I struggle with. But I do love the life that emerges from them when they're followed. I love the kind of people that emerge from the ashes of this broken world when they choose God. I've not always loved obedience. I've not always loved patience. But I loved growing up in a home where mom and dad loved us. And I never wondered if, if their marriage was going to last. I didn't always like the standards that were put on us, the morals of the Bible. But I do like the fact that we can have fun without getting drunk, and I remember it the next day. Amen. I've never struggled with clinical depression, even though uh, I've gone through discouragements of life. I like not knowing what it's like to be addicted to a drug. I like that. Young person, you don't have to experience this world. Some of you know what it's like, and you know that God can give victory over it, but it's a hard-fought battle. You know what true victory is. Remember our text, or one of our texts, To him that overcometh I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father. True worship requires truth. It requires love. It requires all of those things. I'm out of time. I'm going to stop right there. But I, I want to leave you with this because one of the last things that happens with a piece of artwork is a display. And let me just leave you with this verse and an illustration. The Bible says this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You are artwork. People are supposed to see you, Christian. And listen, if you're here and you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, I, I encourage you, look at the light of God's Word. Let Him start the artwork. Let Him start the masterpiece in your life. The one million dollar painting, and I can't even pronounce it. It's, I even put pronunciation here and I forgot. I had to listen to it on YouTube and I still can't even remember it. But it's, it's 
uh, spelled T-R-E-S-P-E-R-S-O-N-A-G-E-S. It's, it's today's personas. Today's personas. Anyone know art? No, neither do I. Okay, we're on the same page here. <coughs> anyway, this is a famous $1 million piece of art that years ago sat on the sidewalk of a New York City street on trash day, waiting to be collected. There were black bags, blue bags, stacks of boxes. But as Elizabeth Gibson walked by a waiting pile on Broadway, she noticed the 38 by 51 inch painting among the bags. The size of the painting compared to the size of her apartment didn't deter her. And she took the painting home that day. Years later, Gibson was watching an episode of Antiques Roadshow and heard a description of the painting. The description was that of her painting. She found out that it was painted by Rufino Tamio. Tamio? And it had been stolen 20 years ago. It also had an open file with the FBI, with the FBI. It was valued at $1 million and had a $15,000 finder's fee attached to it. She returned the painting to the rightful owner, but the interesting thing is she received the $15,000 from the same person that had put it with the trash years ago. Many of us live our lives this way. We've put our Christianity with all of the filth of the world. And then we wonder why no one's impressed by our Christianity. And it, it ends up getting taken. Pastor Dunlop gave an illustration about this years ago. It was a, a famous, uh, famous jewelry heist and what the... Jew, the, the jewelry thieves did was they knew that um, they couldn't, the security in this place was too good for them to be able to get in and get the jewelry out. But what they did is they got somebody hired on, and this person that was in there was able to slowly, over the course of an evening, switch out the costume jewelry for the real jewelry. They switched out the price tags. So the would be thieves went in that day and they paid for, they bought real jewelry with the price of the costume jewelry. And many of us as Christians, we've done the exact same thing. Society has, by and large, as well. We've minimized the things that really are important, and we've sold them cheaply for the things in this life that are cheap. I'm curious today, what does God want to do with you? What is the masterpiece that God is trying to paint in your life? What is, the, what is the, the step? Maybe in your family is the next Charles Spurgeon, and God is just waiting to finish that painting. But there's just too much resistance. Uh, maybe maybe you're, the, you're the classic car, and all you see is a pile of junk. And somebody the other day that came by, and I have a 1970 Chevy that's been sitting under a tarp next to Sherry's house over here that I want to finish. I want to do what I did to my dump truck. A little better, hopefully. <laughs> and somebody was looking at it, and, and, uh, and, and they were asking me what was under the tarp, and I just pulled it up halfway, and they go, oh, just an old beat-up truck. I'm like, bro, that is a classic. What do you mean an old beat-up truck? And maybe this morning that's what you're seeing. You look at your life and you go, I'm just an old beat up truck. God says, no, 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 no. You're a classic. If you're here and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, would you claim the promise of God? It starts at the cross of Calvary. He died for you. He saved your soul. If you are not saved, you are headed for an eternal hell, the ultimate destruction of man. It's the truth of God's word. I'm not saying that because I'm being angry or I'm upset. I'm saying that because I do love you. I care about you. I want you to know for sure that you have a home in heaven. It's not joining this church. This church can't save you. It's not confessing to a pastor. Pastor can't save you. I needed Christ to save my own pathetic soul. But what we can do is show you from the word of God 
how you can be saved. Amen. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Uh, the, the Bible says in verse 13 of that same portion of Scripture, uh, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's Jesus Christ that saves you. Let the artwork start. Maybe for the Christian that, yeah, man, we're seeing VBS, things are happening, and your summer's already gotten away from you. You really haven't had an opportunity to serve God, to get in. and It's time to make some changes. You're sick of sitting on the easel in God's den. It's time to be up on the mantle. It's time for the, the artist to be able to say, oh, this picture's, this picture's ready to be displayed. Would you be displayed today? Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed as the musicians come forward. And listen, Christian, if God's spoken to your heart, don't wait, don't delay. If you're here and you don't know for sure if you got a home in heaven, Pastor Yant is going to be up here in the front. And if you don't know for sure, we would love to show you that he can show you. If you're a lady, we can have one of our ladies show you. Uh, our wives are here. They would love to take you in a side room, show you from the scriptures how you can know for sure that you have a home in heaven and this masterpiece of God can begin. But if you're hearing you say, Pastor, I'm not serving God the way that I should. I'm not involved the way that I ought to be. I'm not the masterpiece yet. I've been on the easel. It's a great time to come to the altar of God, get that taken care of. Dad, Mom... It's time to get back. It's time to start serving the Lord again. It's time to be, to be presented. Father, we thank you for this time. We pray for this invitation. Lord, we leave it in your hands. And God, we just pray that you'd work in every heart as you see fit. If there be anyone here that is not saved, God, I pray that, God, you, you would convict them, that you'd show them their need of salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together. Page 65, Near the Cross, great song, Keep Me Near the Cross as we sing. Jesus, keep me near. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. This is as private, as personal as we can make it for you. Listen, if you're here and you don't know for sure that you have a home in heaven, don't wait, don't delay. Nobody in this room is worth dying and going to hell for. And the truth is, is anybody that's truly your friend's rooting for you for this, for, for this decision. They want you to know for sure that you have a home in heaven. This life is going to end, and, and everything the Bible has said is coming to pass. We're seeing it all around us. Listen, don't trust in some ceremony to save you. Don't trust, and maybe you got baptized in this church. Baptism in this church can't save your soul. The Bible says it's in Christ and Him alone. It's in Jesus Christ. Baptism is simply a picture of that. Oh, maybe you had a conversation with me and you're trusting in that. Or maybe you're just trusting in a prayer that you prayed. And listen to that. None of those things save you. Faith and trust in Jesus Christ saves you. The Bible says, He that believeth is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life.
Christian, maybe you need to live for the Lord. Amen. We all need to live for the Lord. We're all a masterpiece. You ever think of yourself that way? I certainly haven't. And the older I get, the more I look in the mirror, the less I see any kind of masterpiece there. But you know what? That's the cool thing. It's not about you. It's about the God in which we serve. He is really the masterpiece. Let Him be the masterpiece in you and through you. Let's serve God this year. This, this year, it's, half, it's over half over. you believe that? We're almost in 2023. Man, summer's just about gone. Kids are just about to go to school. Ugh, it's awful. Church is supposed to be uplifting. If you're saved, you have every reason to be uplifted. If you're here and you're not saved, though, or you're not sure, you have questions about it, please don't leave here without talking to me. I'd love to sit down and just talk to you and show you from the scriptures how you can know for sure that you have a home in, in, in heaven. And Christian, don't leave here the same that you came in. Regardless of how you came in, let's leave different. Let's leave more dedicated to God. Let Him start painting that picture in your life again. Brother Lanfear, would you close us in prayer? Don't forget we have our uh, snack time next door, and then we come back in here for the afternoon service. And uh, uh, um, those that are involved in VBS, we're going to be meeting, I believe it's over there. Um, we'll be meeting over there during that service. And then, uh, Veda, is there, any, uh, is there any practice after the service today for the, the men's ensemble? So if you're, if you're involved in the men's ensemble, then, and that's gone pretty fast. So if we all just, after that afternoon service, kind of get back in here, and Pastor Stewart will, will remind us of that after the afternoon service as well. All right, Brother Lanfear. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the message that we heard today. Father, we thank you for the full house, Lord. And we do ask, Pastor mentioned uh, a couple of times, Father, we do uh, just ask and beg this morning, Father, that there is someone here this morning that does not know you as their Savior, Father, they would find the courage, uh, Lord, to put aside the pride, Father, and the fear, and Lord, ask someone how they can know you as their Savior, Father. We do ask to bless the food and the fellowship next door. And uh, Father, we do pray for BBS this week, Father. It is, a, it, is a, it is this church's desire, Father, to see people saved. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.